right, thank you very much. My name is Diane Amen. I am the Associate Dean for International Programs and Strategic Initiatives. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the rededication of the Louis B. Sohn Library on International Relations and the 38th birthday of the Dean Rusk International Law Center and the 70th birthday party for the Charter of the United Nations. I think by the end of today's proceedings, you will understand why we are celebrating all those three things. I'm going to hand uh, the podium over to uh, Dean Rutledge in a moment. You see on your program what the order of proceedings is. We will try to proceed with dispatch so that our keynote speaker um, will have ample time to talk. Uh, I will come up right before he uh, is ready to speak to introduce him. Thank you very much, everybody. We look forward to this evening. Um, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Bill Rutledge, and I'm the Dean of the University of Georgia School of Law. And it's with great pleasure that I welcome you here as we rededicate the Louis B. Sohn Library and celebrate the 38th birthday of the Dean Rusk International Law Center on the, he on the heels of United Nations Day. Um, this law school's tradition in international law runs deep. Uh, it can be traced to the 1940s when German Jewish judge Sigmund Cohn joined our faculty. And on his heels, soon we saw the addition of some of the great practitioners and scholars of international law in the 20th century, individuals like former Secretary of State Dean Rusk and Louis Sohn, whose library we honor today, former president of the American Society of International Law, who helped draft the UN Charter and the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And I would encourage all of you, if you haven't done so already, to take the occasion to peruse the private collection of Professor Sohn that Dean Amen and the law school's dedicated library staff have worked so hard to relocate and make publicly available to you. And on the heels of individuals like Judge Cohn, Secretary Rusk, Professor Sohn, we're so honored today to have people like Dean Amen, Harlan Cohn, and others who carry forward the law school's longstanding legacy in international law and global preparedness. Global preparedness at a time of globalization is a need for lawyers more than ever. And we're proud to say that with the support of people like Dean Amen, we offer a great opportunity for global preparedness, whether it be through the summer program in Oxford that Professor Joe Miller now runs, taking the torch from Dean Laurie Ringhand and Professor David Shipley, the summer study program in Europe that Dean Amen and Laura Coggle have worked very hard to grow, the law school's Master of Law programs that has been offered training for foreign trained lawyers for more than 40 years, and the types of international judicial training that Rich Reeves and others through the Institute of Continuing Judicial Education have provided. We also have a great tradition of hosting international law scholars here through exchanges with groups like the Bar Alan University in Israel and the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. These exchanges allow for the law school to be a partner in an international dialogue that cuts across boundaries and bridges oceans. Another way that the law school and its students help prepare students for the situation of global preparedness is through the long-standing and well-respected Georgia Journal of International and Comparative Law. And consistent with its tradition of hosting great symposia and conferences, I invite all of you to return on February 19th, where the Georgia Journal will host a conference on the debut of the International Committee of the Red Cross's updated commentaries on the Geneva Conventions, something that we're most proud to be home for. Turning back to today's event, I would not be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the many fine people who helped create the facility in which we support today's activities. Individuals like Ron Ellington, Don Johnson, Larry Walker, and others. Larry Walker, the individual whose name is in honor of this room today, played an instrumental role in securing the funds necessary for the construction of Dean Rusk Hall. He's a shining example of the sorts of alumni and alumnae of the law school that have given back to the school through their service, commitment, and dedication. For more than 30 years, he served in the Georgia General Assembly and for 16 years as the majority leader of the House. He's presently a member of the University System of Georgia Board of Regents and a partner at his named firm in Perry, Georgia. Larry wanted more than nothing else to be here today, 
because he too took a personal investment in the Rusk Center. But facing an unavoidable conflict, he shared a letter that he asked me to read to you all. Dear Dean Rutledge, recently I wrote an article for the Macon's Telegraph entitled, Things That I Have Learned As I Have Gotten Older. One of the things that I've learned that was not mentioned in my article was that much of the success we have in life is the result of being at the right place and at the right time. Today, as you rededicate the Rusk Center and Sohn Library, I have a feeling I may be in the wrong place at the right time. However, when plans for the construction of Dean Rusk Hall, including the raising the money for this project, were being done during and prior to April 1992, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. When I became majority leader in the Georgia House in 1986, I was deeply involved in the state of Georgia's budget process, being a conferee from the House and the budget. As a consequence of my position in the State House, I was able to procure, with the help of Speaker Tom Murphy and others, money from the state necessary to help the construction of the Dean Rusk Center. We needed to get the taxpayers involved, and we did. Definitely the right place at the right time. I had the great assistance of Professor Perry Sintel and then Dean Ron Ellington. With Perry Sintel, I changed from being a, quote, former student to being a, quote, friend. And with Dean Ron Ellington, I changed from being an acquaintance to being a friend. Definitely the opportunity to work with these two outstanding individuals was for me being in the right place at the right time. In 1992, at the groundbreaking of the Dean Rusk Center, I was there with former Dean Ellington, Governor Carl Sanders, former Secretary of State Rusk, UGA President Chuck Knapp, and others. I have a photograph to prove it. Indeed, the right place at the right time. Today, as you celebrate the Sohn Rusk ceremonies, I will be with some of the University System of Georgia Regents and Georgia State University officials at the High Angular Resolution Astronomy Array in Mount Wilson, California. I will be looking at the stars, but my heart will be in Athens, the wrong place at the right time. What great progress the University of Georgia School of Law has made since 1965. What great progress the University of Georgia School of Law has made since the Rusk Center groundbreaking in 1992. What great progress the University of Georgia has made in the last 50 years. Thank you, Perry Sintel. Thank you, Tom Ron Ellington. Thank you, Dean Rusk. Thank you, Carl Sanders. Thank you, Carl, Tom Murphy. And thanks to so many others. I am glad that all of you were in the right place at the right time. Sincerely, Larry Walker. Now I'd like to add my thanks to Larry's for those of you who, who played a tremendous role in the center. And at this moment, I'd like all of you to join me in a round of applause for Associate Dean of International Programs and Strategic Initiative, Diane Amon. <laughs> Diane, you carry the torch that these individuals mentioned in Larry's letter built. And I'm so proud to see this day come to fruition for you. Know how hard you've worked. And along the lines of the last person, I want to thank Professor Harlan Cohen, my friend and colleague, to talk to you about today's events. Harlan. Welcome. And first, I'd like to add my thanks to those, first to Dean Amon for putting together this extraordinary event that celebrates our past, present, and future, to Dean Rutledge for the continuing support of the Law School for International Programs, and to all of you our distinguished alumni, guests, and students who, through your collective dedication, make the University of Georgia a center for international law in the world. It's my great honor to be able to celebrate one of the founders of international law at the University of Georgia, Sigmund Cohn. Uh, and although Sigmund Cohn retired in 1964 and passed away in 1997, 10 years before I even got here, I feel a strong personal connection to Sigmund Cohn. And it's not just the similarity of our last names. Uh, Sigmund Cohen is known to have initiated the teaching of international law at the University of Georgia, my field, um, as well as, starting, to the start, start as uh, starting the development of the Law Library's collection of international law uh, books and materials, something we are celebrating some of today. Um, but more than that, uh, Sigmund Cohen was the first Jewish professor at the University of Georgia, not just the law school, and as an advisor for the Jewish Law Students Association, who is a co-sponsor for this event, I've, I recognize that we very much walk along the path that he has tread for us. I also learned from some of my research for today that 
Uh, when my former colleague Perry Santel took Cohn's class as a student, he found, quote, Dr. Cohn to be extremely knowledgeable, extremely thorough, and extremely fast. Dr. Cohn could lecture faster than any teacher I've ever had. This sounds a lot to like one of my better student evaluations. As a transplanted New Yorker, I, I can relate. But more, but more broadly, Sigmund Cohn's story is an inspiration for all of us at the University of Georgia. We should all aspire to his courage, curiosity, professionalism, and generosity of spirit and soul. But more broadly, his story is a story that's inspirational for our law school. It's a story about what our law school can be when it is its best self, and what it should be in, for the future. Sigmund Cohn's story starts in 1898, uh, in a place somewhere now in Poland. After earning his doctors of law degree from the University of Breslau, Sigmund Cohn scored such high marks on the examinations that he was invited to take a job at the Department of Justice in Berlin and eventually was appointed as a judge in Germany. After Hitler's rise to power, Sigmund Cohn was forced from his job and he and his family, uh, his wife Suzelle, who became Suzanne here in the United States and her two daughters, were forced to first immigrate to Genoa, Italy, where at the University of Genoa he earned his doctor of jurisprudence and taught. But then when Mussolini announced that he would be adopting in Italy the same policies as the Nazis with regard to Jews, Sigmund Cohn was again forced to look for somewhere else to go. Uh, he began by looking for places in the United States that might be interested in inviting him to come teach. But given, in part, the restrictive immigration laws of the day in the United States, he had to search relatively widely and was able to get visas to places like Colombia and Costa Rica as well. It's here where Sigmund Cohn's story intersects with another important member of our law school history and community, Harold Hirsch. Harold Hirsch Hall uh, is the building right down there. It's where I have my office. And in 1932, it was dedicated in honor of Harold Hirsch, then a very famous general counsel of Coca-Cola, um, also a former player on the Georgia football team. Um, but importantly for this story, a prominent member of the Atlanta Jewish community who by the late 1930s had become very involved in refugee work. And he heard the story of Sigmund Cohen and heard that Sigmund Cohen had an invitation to come speak at, to come teach at the University of Georgia, but that the University of Georgia under state law at the time could not pay him because he was not a citizen. In a great act of generosity, Harold Hirsch agreed to pay Sigmund Cohn's salary for two years, which then allowed him to come and immigrate with his family. Unfortunately, Cohn and his family were not able to actually thank Harold Hirsch themselves, as Harold Hirsch passed away three weeks after they arrived in Georgia. Um, after they got here, Sigmund Cohn started by teaching in the language departments, uh, teaching German, Italian, and after he taught it to himself, Spanish. Um, but he also uh, taught some courses in the law school, in particular comparative law, and as it would have it, showing how deep these connections run and how important all of these uh, intersecting lines go. I received a note just the other day from a prominent international lawyer who informed me that her mother, who was a UGA law graduate, a class of 1941, remembered very fondly taking comparative law classes from Sigmund Cohn. Uh, eventually in 1944, Sigmund Cohn joined the faculty of the law school, in which role he was able to enrich not just the law school, but the faculty and his students. Um, and although he retired in 1964, he remained very much involved with the school, including writing very long articles on the European Court of Human Rights, very important articles for the Georgia Journal of International and Comparative Law. Uh, in 1984, he was honored with the Distinguished Service Scroll. And in 1988, his students commissioned for him the portrait um, that <coughs> was downstairs. After his retirement, he very much remained involved with the faculty and the students um, and, and with the community in general. Uh, he remained very much a mentor to many people here. Uh, the, the word most commonly used with regard to him that I found is beloved, um, which seems apt. And it, it's been my great pleasure to be able to hear about Sigmund Cohen and the legacy he left from many of my colleagues and former colleagues. It is our special honor to be able to try to continue to live up to the ideals he has set. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to one of our distinguished alum, alumni, Ken Dias. I think when I first saw Dean Russ, I was a young kid in high school uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm from Athens, and I'm standing there and worried about whether the world is going to come to an end or not. And Dean Russell was the Secretary of State under John Kennedy. 
And I progressed from there up until the Georgia Law School. When I got to the Georgia Law School, I went undergrad at the University of Georgia and has been a young man that grew up in the Civil Rights Movement and coming into the University of Georgia and then from the undergrad to the University of Georgia Law School. Tensions were still high in regard to racial matters and we were trying to find our way, particularly the black students. When I arrived at the University of Georgia Law School, <coughs> there was only two people had graduated. One was Chester Devonport, the first black graduate, and of course Justice Bob Benham, who now still serves on the Supreme Court of Georgia, whom I know both men very well. So when I was a student here my freshman year, we still were struggling as to what and how we were going to be perceived and accepted in the University of Georgia Law School. And while I was here during my freshman year, <clears throat> I heard rumors one of my uh, classmates told me, say, hey, they're going to bring Dean Russ to Georgia's law school, and they're going to build um, something in his honor. I said, they're going to bring Dean Russ to the South? I, I, I don't believe that. I just told him, I simply do not believe that, because this center was acceptable to any university in the country. Because Dean Russ had been one of the most outstanding Secretary of State that we ever had. And everybody knew his views on race relations. I said, I don't believe they're going to bring Dean Russ here. But by lo lo and behold, it did happen. And when he came in, he was a soothing effect in regard to Georgia Law School and race relations. And when I finally had a chance to meet Dean Russ, the first time chance I had to meet him, he invited the students particularly, he made sure that all other black students came over to his house. And he had this brunch and he sat down and he talked and he told stories. And I'll tell you a little, a little bit of story that I love to tell a little bit. He told stories and so forth. And I'm standing there in awe. Because basically, I'm still just a guy from a rural town of Athens, Georgia. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm being this type of person the first time in my life. Dean Russ could just mesmerize you. He was a diplomat of diplomats. I mean, he just had that way about him. And he would come and he would talk to the students. And it, the biggest thing that he always had was an open door policy for all students, regardless of race, creed, or color. And if you had a problem that you think that you could not deal with through the mainstream of law school, you could go, always go to Dean Russ. If you needed some advice, you could always go to Dean Russ. And he would always stop in the hallway, make you feel welcome, and talk to you. And I would go to some of his lectures that he would have uh, down in the basement. And he would just come in there and talk to students. And he was a great guy. But this, this is the biggest thing, telling you a story I remember about Dean Russ. I didn't realize he was from Georgia until I got to really know him. And he would sit down, I was over his house one day and told me this story. He was from Cherokee County. And we were talking. And he told me that his uh, people, well, I won't say his daddy he was, was a bootlegger. <laughs> and, you know, and I kind of identified with that because my granddaddy was kind of endeavored in that field. <laughs> that's how we became great friends, because to the young people in this room, believe it or not, they had a thing a called party lines. You know, there, there was no private phone. There certainly was no cell phone. Nobody even thought about them at that time. And he would tell this story that when the revenues came around, you know, they would just show up, because it still gets a lot of bootleg now, bootleg liquor. So they had a special ring that everybody would bootleg and they would get on the phone, they had a special ring to let everybody know that the revenue was around and you need to kind of clean up your act before they hit your house. <laughs> and I really identified that story and I just adored Dean Russ. I was just, uh, uh, never have met anybody of that quality in my life and he brought a lot to the Georgia Law School, and he particularly brought a lot for the black students, because we now felt 
that if Dean Russ was here, everything was going to be all right. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dorinda Dahlmeyer, and for 21 years I worked at the Rusk Center. But today I want to speak about something else. It was my great honor to be asked by Professor Sohn to speak at the first dedication of his library in 1997. So I want to share those words again with you today. Nothing could be more <coughs> symbolic of Professor Sohn than his books, for he was certainly a man of the book. Those of us who had the great good fortune to cross paths with Professor Sohn found him to be an unequaled mentor, colleague, and friend. For those of us who were his students, we knew that when we went to his office to talk with him, we would find him nestled among his books. Every horizontal surface in his office would be covered with books and documents and reports. It wasn't that he didn't know how to shelve them, we learned that these piles of documents were all his current projects. To answer our questions, he would zero in on a stack and give it the practiced eye of a stratigrapher and select a document that was directly pertinent to the problem we brought with us through the door. As I said, all the horizontal surfaces were occupied except for one. There was always a chair open and available for his students. Professor Sohn amazed us with his recall of documents which serve as the foundation of international law. He was a person with one foot firmly grounded in the works of those who had gone before us. For his students and colleagues, Professor Sohn sometimes had the opportunity to remind us that many of our bright ideas actually were proposed first by our great-great-grandparents. Of course, as any survey of his own writings attest, Professor Sohn himself was a prodigious source of those foundational works. One select bibliography of his principal publications, published in 1990 by the ABA as part of a tribute to Professor Sohn, listed 260 publications in the areas of international law, dispute settlement, law of the sea and protection of the environment, disarmament and arms control, protection of human rights, the United Nations, regional organizations, and conflict of laws, or to borrow a phrase from one of his titles, from outer space to inner space. <laughs> Professor Sohn's ideas often were innovative and way ahead of their time. He published the first article proposing zonal inspection for verifying disarmament agreements in 1960 nearly 30 years before it became an accepted practice between the superpowers. He wrote an article on how to teach human rights law long before most law schools offered any type of international law course for their students. He published guides to the basic documents of the United Nations and to regional organizations so that those who came after him could understand the intent and meaning behind those documents. Despite his attention to the past, Professor Sun was hardly its captive, for he had the other foot planted firmly in the future. We were waiting in the airport together to return to Athens after a meeting, and I was amused to see Professor Sun bring out from his bag reading material that was not some volume of Hugo Grotius, but a science fiction paperback. Oh, he said, I read these all the time. I like to see how civilizations on other planets and galaxies go about resolving their problems. It might be helpful down here. <laughs> Another aspect of his hope for the future was the careful nurturing of his students. We knew we were his top priorities. He never canceled a class because he was needed in Washington or New York. The world had to wait on us. Sometimes this nurturing process was a bit painful, <coughs> as when students discovered that he not only read and made comments on the first drafts of term papers, he also corrected the punctuation in the footnotes. But we sensed that he was making an investment in us for the long term. 
those of us who were his students and who now are privileged to stand before our own students have in Professor Sohn an impeccable model for carrying out our responsibilities as educators. Those of us who now spend our professional lives in the realm of international law because of his influence value his insight and encouragement of our endeavors to expand and adapt the field. Professor Sohn's open-minded enthusiasm for international law and for us made hopeful possibilities and serve as a beacon for all of us who trail along in his wake. His library represents his living legacy, typifying not only Professor Sohn's intellect, but his humanity. And for that, we indeed are deeply grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Bo, Harlan, Ken, and Dorinda for those really wonderful comments and tributes. It's my great honor and pleasure to uh, welcome back, after 27 years, one of our most valued alumni. His name is Kanan Rajarathinam. My understanding is he wishes to be called Kanan, and that is the tradition in his country. He tells me that Rajarathinam is his father's name. He is here with his lovely wife, Usha. Yes, we had a very interesting dinner last night with two Ushas at a table. Uh, Dean Rodriguez, I think it may have been the first time in her life where there was another Usha at the table. <laughs> she was very happy for the occasion. They are traveling here um, from uh, Basra, Iraq, in Kanan's, uh, Kanan's case where he is the head of office for the United Nations Assistance Mission for Iraq, UNAMI. This is his 21st year with the United Nations exclusively in conflict zones. He has served in Basra, Baghdad, Kabul, Cyprus, and all over the former Yugoslavia. Sometimes his family has been able to be with him, most of the time in the former Yugoslavia, never in Afghanistan, and never in India. So I think we need to thank Usha as much as Kanan for their service truly to humanity. He has been with the United Nations, as I say, since 1993. He has served in several capacities and performed mediation and negotiations functions. As a guest faculty member, he has taught international organizations at the University of Madras, which is one of his alma maters in addition to not only Georgia Law, where he received his LLM degree in 1988, um, but also from Tufts University, from which he received his doctorate. He has been a junior professor of law at Madras College. He has practiced law, served as a translator and newsreader with All India Radio, and was a formal advisor to the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu. Kanan's first writing on one of India's modern leaders was published by Penguin Viking, and his second work is due for publication by Random House next year. As I say, he has an LLM in international law from this law school, where he was an honorary fellow of the Dean Rusk International Law Center, and was very pleased today to meet one of his successors, Pedro Dorado, who holds that position today, as well as the many student ambassadors that we have working with us. He is a native of Chennai, also known as Madras in India, and he and Usha have two children. I welcome him to the podium now where he is going to give us a talk called The UN at 70, Pursuing Peace in the 20th Century. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for that very uh, uh, generous uh, and most kind words. Not everyone uh, can be as lucky as Dorinda, who ended up with the Dean Rusk Center for 21 years. Others like me spent 21 years with the UN. <laughs> <laughs> In a 1977 interview, Professor Sohn recalled that on his return from the 1945 Charter Conference, 
Harvard had wondered if he could come up with a cause on United Nations, because nobody else would teach anything so crazy. Dean Rutledge, Associate Dean for International Programs and Strategic Initiatives, Diane Maria Mann, faculty, staff, students, my host family, the Pritchetts, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you would concur with me that the United Nations is certainly not so crazy an idea anymore. For here we are, like in other parts of the world, marking its 70 years existence. I'm honored to be present at Georgia Law on the seminal occasion of rededicating Professor Sohn's library. Professor Sohn strode the worlds of international law and academia like a colossus. The statute of the International Court of Justice, the Convention of the Law of the Sea, and the countless students whom he took under his wings would forever speak to his legacy. I was one of those fortunate students. Professors Thomas Schonbaum and the late Gabriel Wilner's trust in me, a first generation high school graduate from a modest Indian background, made Georgia law possible for me. I wish to record my deep sense of gratitude to them and the school on this occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, at its 70th birthday, the United Nations can look back with a certain degree of satisfaction of its contribution to making this world a more agreeable place. Be it diffusing the Cuban Missile Crisis, restoring Kuwait's freedom, the 1992 United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Millennium Development Goals of 2000, from this year, the Sustainable Development Goals, eradicating smallpox, <coughs> polio, fighting AIDS, or Ebola, assisting the 60 million refugees and internally displaced, responding in the tsunami's aftermath, protecting human rights, promoting the empowerment of women, or regulating the use of the internet. The world without the United Nations is likely to be a, a less orderly place. Equally for all the above, I'm sure one can draw up, a, draw up a longer catalog of the UN's failures. The more recent and continuing tragedy, Syria, will hang on the conscience of the UN for a long time to come. Palestine, Vietnam, Falklands, Afghanistan, Iran-Iraq war, Rwanda, Bosnia, and Somalia. The list would be rather long. The longer list is only demonstrative of the high expectations that we pin on the UN and our disappointment, if not despair, for its inability to measure up to our expectations. But the UN's successes and failures have to be seen in context. The UN is not a world government, and the Secretary General is no czar. Founded after the two worst human follies, the two world wars, the UN is a reflection of both our human aspirations and failings, and therefore us. It is the only global forum where all nations, big and small, wealthy and not so wealthy, democratic and not so democratic, open and closed, have the opportunity to meet, discuss, and strive for agreements as equals. Despite these differences, member states are fiercely united when it comes to sovereignty and national interests, and rightly so. It is their sovereign right to deal with internal and bilateral issues as they deem fit. Northern Ireland is a classic case, and it is not clear if the UN could ever wield the kind of influence and authority of a major power. The Iran nuclear deal is a more recent example of major powers in a regional body, able to reach agreement with the member state with mostly technical assistance from a UN organ, the International Atomic Energy Agency. The UN, nevertheless, embodies the collective will of the international community. The UN Charter, as we know, prohibits military action except in self-defense. Only the Security Council can confer legitimacy when it comes to the use of force. Such UN sanction is a result of consensus. When the Security Council is not united, the UN is left with no substantial role to prevent, diffuse, or resolve conflict. What we consider as UN success is actually a reflection of this harmony. Kuwait remains a shining example. Thanks to the Security Council's unity on Kuwait, 
close to a million men and women from 34 countries were engaged in rolling back Saddam Hussein's aggression in 1991. When the Security Council fails to act, the Secretary General steps in to urge and goad the Council to action. And many rightly wonder why the Secretary General is not more forceful, visible, or decisive on issues. In the popular imagination, the UN or the Secretary General should be able to change things or correct their course. The Secretary General represents and symbolizes the UN more than anyone else. He has no personal agenda. He plays an independent, impartial, and catalytic role in promoting the UN's founding goals of a peaceful and a prosperous Earth. Consequently, he is the world's conscience keeper, imbued with a degree of moral authority and suasion, unmatched in the temporal world. A secular pope, if you may, but much like the pope, the Secretary General too has no legions under his command and has to depend on his moral stature, diplomacy and member states' armies to wage peace. Secretaries General weigh in with their moral authority carefully when diplomacy fails. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, for instance, expressed shame and anger at the international community's impotence to stop the war in Syria. Pretty harsh words indeed, but no less understandable. Since then, however, the situation in Syria has become even more complicated. Syria is a reflection of the destruction that human beings are capable of in the name of power and dogma. Half of Syria's 22 million are uprooted, four million are refugees, and the sight in September of a dead Syrian refugee child on the Turkish coast moved all except those who could stop the madness. Yet public preaching does not always serve the cause and can worsen an already difficult situation. More often than not, the Secretary General relies on quiet diplomacy and works behind the scenes. Nonetheless, whether it is a visible engagement, as in Cyprus or otherwise, the unwritten code of conduct is for the parties to take credit when things happen and blame the UN when they go wrong. Ban Ki-moon recently said that the acronym SG stands for scapegoat and not Secretary General. <laughs> the UN is only stronger because of such self-effacement and by virtue of having a realistic view of its abilities and role in a world of member states, geopolitics, and national interests. Despite its many activities, peace remains the UN's main occupation. Yet, peacekeeping itself is not found in the UN Charter. Whoever thought of it understood that one could not pursue peace in the midst of active hostilities. Peace was a prerequisite, and it had to hold. What better than the presence of unarmed soldiers drawn from elsewhere, and therefore impartial, to serve as a deterrent and incentive to the parties to hold fire? Peacekeeping was turning soldiering on its head. Trained to fight wars, soldiers in their new roles were to campaign for peace by mainly monitoring, reporting, and engaging in small confidence-building roles. The first blue helmets of peacekeepers were ironically a consequence of a UN decision in 1947, favoring the partition of Palestine. Soon, war broke out between Israelis and the Arabs. Sweden's Count Folk Bernadette, the first mediator in UN history, was to use his good offices among others, to promote a peaceful adjustment of the future situation of Palestine. Good offices and facilitation would become the soul of UN mediation. Additionally, the Count was to supervise a ceasefire with the support of a group of unarmed military observers. United Nations Truce Supervision Organization, UNSO, or the UN's first peacekeeping mission was born. Kashmir followed, and since then, the UN has deployed 68 peacekeeping operations with 56 of these since the end of the Cold War. Three core principles guide UN peacekeeping. Impartiality, the UN is not supposed to take sides. Consent of the parties, no consent, no UN engagement. Non-use of force, the UN will not use force except in self-defense. Needless to say, these core principles have been seriously tested over the years as peacekeeping has come to encompass enforcement, humanitarian missions, and the protection of civilians. Impartiality was tested early on when Count Bernadette was assassinated in 1949.
The death of the first peacekeeper made it painfully clear that no amount of UN impartiality would be sufficient in the eyes of the parties, and that UN peacekeeping risked the peril of being evaluated subjectively and even demanding the ultimate sacrifice. 11 years later, in the 1960s, the UN itself would forsake impartiality in the Congo to protect Congo's territorial integrity. With the Count's death, his proposals and the early chances of a Middle East settlement also withered away. Palestine, Kashmir, Korea, and many such frozen conflicts demonstrate that peacekeeping is no panacea. Durable peace is often the work of the parties themselves and calls for very painful compromises. Human resolve to wage war was put to test in Korea. This was the first time that the UN sanctioned uh, a force. With the UN sanction, a unified command of the US waged war to push back the North. President Truman, Truman chose to approach the United Nations. President Bush Sr. would emulate him in the case of Kuwait. Congressional approval would have taken time, but the merits of UN sanction appear to have weighed in. Ironically, Korea cost Secretary General Thirgvi Lee his extension. The USSR felt he had acted beyond his powers. The first Secretary General had to resign. The Korean War made it clear early on that the UN and its Secretary General were only as good as the P5 wished them to be. 44 years later, in 1996, Secretary General Bothros Bothros Ghali would experience a similar fate. Only this time, he would have displeased the US. Is consent a necessarily good thing at all times in peacekeeping? The Middle East would reveal that sovereignty and consent, consent perhaps should be second only to peace. Egypt's nationalization of the Suez Canal set off hostilities in the 1960s. Some 6,000 likely armed peacekeepers under the UN emergency force interposed between Israel and Egypt, deploying on the Egyptian side to maintain the truce. Israel had withheld consent for troops to be deployed on its soil. So the troops were only deployed on the Egyptian side. The Suez Canal became operational again. In 1967, however, Egypt too withdrew consent and the force was withdrawn, even as the six-day war in the Middle East between the Arabs and the Israelis happened. The presence of the UN forces had hitherto helped maintain a peace, however surface deep. The hallowed principle of consent had hurt the larger goal of keeping peace. More recently, in 2008, Eritrea's non-cooperation would end the mission there. In retrospect, Eritrea's peace and development would have been better served if the UN had continued. In 1960, Congo would test both the principles of impartiality and the non-use of force. Abandoning impartiality, the UN took up arms against the Katanga secessionists under the foreign mercenaries to help maintain Congo's territorial integrity. Also in a first, civilian personnel, numbering 2,000 at its height, were involved in helping resume essential services. Authoritarianism, weak institutions, insurgency, and the fallout of Rwanda saw the UN return in 1999 to the Congo. In a historical new and to some extent deja vu, the Security Council in 2010 provided for the creation of a force intervention brigade to carry out targeted offensive operations to neutralize insurgents, among other things, in protection of civilians. Clearly, peacekeeping is no more limited to Pacific Chapter 6 operations and has evolved to, among others, protecting civilians. How did we reach here? After the end of the Cold War, a rash of inter-civil wars would break out, and the humanitarian dimensions of these conflicts would challenge all core principles dear to peacekeeping. Also around the same time, a newer player was bearing pressure on the international community. No more could decision-making isolate itself from popular sentiments, for cable television had revolutionized the way the world obtained news. Instant and vivid, it brought news straight to one's living room. Thus, television images of starving children in Somalia, where 3,000 were dying daily, and skeletal Bosniak men in Bosnian Serb camps, 
moved the world's conscience and the Security Council to mandate humanitarian intervention. However, Somalia was lawless and Bosnia was in the midst of a civil war. Without the member states' willingness to take higher risks, these humanitarian interventions were destined to fail. Somalia soon turned ugly. Images of a dead US soldier being dragged on the streets of Mogadishu ended the Somalia experiment in 1994. That same year, Rwanda happened. The UN had not just failed to foresee what was coming there. Worse still, it abandoned thousands of Rwandese who had sought its protection. The next year, Bosnia took place. There, thousands of young, unarmed men were murdered in a UN safe area. The UN and the larger humanity had awfully pay failed. These setbacks introduced a huge credibility crisis to peacekeeping. Clearly, no more could the UN afford the luxury of impartiality if it had to save <coughs> civilians when the state was either unable or unwilling to protect. The low moment for the UN and its humanitarian values led to the responsibility to protect doctrine, which proclaimed that only sovereignty, well exercised, deserved to be respected. In marked contrast to Rwanda and Bosnia in 1999, tens of UN staff, led by the UN envoy there, stayed behind in a show of solidarity with the East Timorese to act as a shield against violence. The principle would see the UN stationing, sanctioning military action in Sierra Leone and in Mali on behalf of the government. If those were a government unable, in Libya, the UN felt the regime was unwilling and made explicit reference to the Libyan authorities' responsibility to protect. Days after the Security Council authorization for all necessary measures, NATO planes began to strike at Gaddafi's forces. The rest is well known. In southern Sudan, as we speak, 200,000 have taken refuge from the civil war in UN premises. Peacekeeping will continue to face further challenges. I foresee two such challenges in this century. The first is the threat of global terrorism. The second is the threat to peace if we fail in our mission towards a sustainable planet. First, let me talk about terrorism. Today, more than the threat of one nation invading another, not that, that these are not taking place. The threat of intolerance induced terrorism is the most formidable danger facing us and the generations to come. The kamikazes were honorable. They gave up their lives to take on enemy targets, and yet they were an exception. Until the last decades, and especially till 9-11, most assassins wished to save themselves even while they wished death for others. In 1991, a suicide bomber killed India's former Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi and 14 others. At around the same time, the world began to see the phenomenon of suicide bombers promoted by Al-Qaeda and later the Taliban and now the Islamic State, Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram. The world would never grow accustomed to assassins who kill innocent children, women, worshippers and others, even if in the process they kill themselves. How does the UN counter an enemy who does not wish to preserve himself? Not just that. This is a formidable enemy who seems to be mutating and growing from strength to strength. Weak institutions, malgovernance, poverty, and the sense of marginalization are a recipe for political instability. However, the recent decades has witnessed radical religious outfits offering solutions and exploiting dissent in these places. Mali is the most recent example. In 2013, French forces acting under UN authority beat back Al-Qaeda-backed local elements that had taken over parts of the country. Today, many parts of the world are unsafe. From Yemen to Syria and Morocco to Nigeria and Chechnya to France, the ugly face of intolerance has shown it can strike at will. While television and social media have given us a graphic idea of the horrors, the indirect dangers of global terrorism are rarely known. Let me give just one example. The World Bank estimated that the 9-11 attacks increased the number of people in poverty by 10 million. Another estimate recorded that the world economy lost in excess of $80 billion because of that one single attack. Today, the Islamic State's depravity makes Al-Qaeda and the Taliban look benign. Syria has given us an inkling into their sick ideology and morbid intolerance. A regular struggle for reforms had quickly generate, degenerated into sectarian strife in Syria. While the world continues to bicker on what to do with the regime there, 
Tens of thousands of Islamic State cadres have stepped into the vacuum to impose their intolerant creed, while all those who have not fallen in line have suffered the plight of the religious minorities has been particularly heartrending. In August and September alone, tens of thousands of Syrians caught between the Islamic State and the regime risked their lives across oceans and countries to reach Europe to preserve whatever was left of the human worth. In neighboring Iraq, where I work, a third of the country is in the hands of the Islamic State. The US-led 60-state coalition against the terrorist outfit has had limited success so far. Security experts have made it clear that the fight against the terrorist outfit will be protracted. A UN estimate believes that more than 25,000 foreign trained fighters from 100 member states have traveled to Syria and Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Libya. A think tank estimates that the Islamic State could mobilize about 250,000 fighters across Syria and Iraq. Last July, the US Federal Bureau of Investigation estimated that dozens of US citizens between the ages of 18 and 62 have traveled to Iraq and Syria to join the Islamic State. Online, the Islamic State has nearly 21,000 English language Twitter followers, thousands of whom could be from the US, according to the FBI. As I said earlier, how do you fight those who don't care to live and would die and kill for their cause, however blighted that cause could be? We are in agreement that approaches depending on force alone will not defeat terrorism. This is a war that has to be fought at different levels. These proponents of hate and violence have skillfully exploited real and perceived notions of inequality, both social and religious, attracting those with an identity crisis and underconfidence of themselves and their faith. Even those with good educational backgrounds are trapped in the warped promises of establishing the supremacy of the faith, regretfully not by reason or debates, but by the sheer force of violence. The difficulty is that, that the moderates of the faith are yet to speak up more vocally or have been silenced. The tyranny of the violent minority seems to have triumphed so far, and the burden of combating this intolerant and xenophobic strain is mostly left to those from other faiths. Those few moderate voices need to grow into many so that one day the voice of the extremists and their reach could be eclipsed. They need encouragement and reassurance from all of us the UN could play a major role in fostering tolerance and understanding between civilizations and religions. As it has brought synergies to the issue of climate change, the UN should galvanize international opinion on fighting terrorism at the social and intellectual levels. To begin with, it might consider declaring 2016 as the year of interfaith dialogue. Secondly, the UN might consider appointing a well-respected leader from the Islamic community as the UN envoy for interfaith dialogue. She, he would work closely with religious leaders, civil society actors and community groups and moderate religious forces to counter hate speech and propaganda. Many of us not necessarily violent wish to see our own cultures and values triumph the rest. The UN could play a role in making us all understand that such thoughts need not descend to violence and hate. Thirdly, the UN should be prepared to take on peacekeeping assignments that will have elements of military counterterrorism. I may add that the report of the High-Level Independent Panel on Peace Operations of 2015 finds the shift inevitable even if the report does not actually favor such a shift. The second major challenge to peace this century is a threat to the planet and the inequalities that arise between, because of it between nations. The unacceptable levels of carbon emissions will continue to bring cataclysmic changes and consequently food and water insecurity. Such insecurity in the 21st century would mean chaos and conflict within and among nations, especially as we, grow, as we are to grow to 8.9 billion in 2050. The UN will need to be better prepared to handle serious bread and water issues within and between nations. I would not be surprised if one day UN peacekeepers monitor the fair distribution of water and food within communities or across nations, even as I hope that it never comes to pass. Until recently, most were simply unaware of the dangers of climate change. The Secretary General, in his characteristic understatement, said recently, it is very important for me to sound alarm bells about climate change. And the UN has done a great job so far. Today, global warming, 2014, was the hottest year ever. And the unprecedented changes in weather have made things clear to all. 
200 nations are to meet in Paris this December to make binding commitments to keep global temperature rise under 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. Most developing countries, and especially India, need help in balancing growth with the environment and making development sustainable. The UN's role will continue to be crucial in providing a forum for the developed and the developing to engage in dialogue and reach a court that balances their national interests with the future of the earth. Human aspirations will be lofty as their cravings sometimes low, and the battle between good and evil and want and greed will keep us preoccupied. The UN is a lofty ideal and can play an effective role to confront the above dangers to peace in this century. For this, it has to become a more responsive body to higher human aspirations and translate them into action in real time. A huge gulf spawns the positions of the General Assembly and the Security Council. The need for equilibrium between the two bodies is long overdue. One way is to make the Security Council resemble more today's General Assembly. This could ensure that the balance of power is more reflective of today than of extra decades. Otherwise, the UN risks going the way of the international monetary institutions, which have not measured up to the aspirations of the developing world. The BRICS Bank is a warning sign. Let us be sure, a more representative UN alone cannot make it a more effective body. Much will continue to hinge on member states and the enlarged Security Council's ability to rise above national interests. Professor Sohn envisaged a time when the United Nations budget would surpass $35 billion, with $25 billion set aside to ease the worst economic disparities between nations. The UN's agencies, funds, and programs engage in developmental work, but it is a trickle in the ocean of need. If only defense budgets can go to combat poverty. He also saw the UN in charge of its own peace forces that would number 400,000. Professor Sohn was a dreamer. Although the UN does not have its own force, and certainly not the size foreseen by him, more than 126,000 military, police, and civilian personnel serve in 16 UN peacekeeping missions today, and 3,326 UN peacekeepers from some 120 countries have died while serving under the UN flag. Their sacrifices should not be in vain. What 70 years of pursuing peace has taught us is that there is nothing more sacred than humanity and the higher humanitarian principles that we are all capable of. Thank you. Shy. Yes. Um, you were talking about global warming uh, being a large crisis uh, for the UN, as well as sovereignty being a huge issue when it comes to countries working together. But why is it being seen up and keeping and keeping up uh, geographic borders? What can we do to help facilitate and try to prevent a larger migrant crisis that is being today? I think we'll have to stay the course on um, uh, climate change. The UN has done that. Uh, a very good job the different uh, um, international um, uh, conferences that the UN had uh, uh, organized and then brought these different major powers together. I think it will call for a lot of painful compromises from the West, in particular uh, the most industrialized countries, and it will also call for some um, a realistic appreciation from the developing world uh, to what they can do in the name of development and what they can't do, because as I was telling somebody before, and uh, India, for instance, which is already the third largest emitter, will continue to be uh, emitting much more. It'll, it'll be very close to the second largest emitter, which will become the US, and the first would be the, the Chinese, if they're not already. And, and uh, we are developing very, very fast. And those who have never had access to a refrigerator in India, or for the first time buying refrigerators, people are buying air conditioners. We can't ask them not to do this. Right? So we'll have to invest in technology that will make these um, environmentally more friendly. And that technology is going to cost us a fortune. Um, so India would not commit to this, and, and so are the other developing countries, which will not commit to this. So it's going to be a, 
a very difficult and uh, a very uh, um, a contentious issue between the uh, the south and, and the, the north. But uh, but I think we will we will figure out because the uh, the dangers that we confront um, will not uh, you know we'll have to stand together as humanity to to rise above it. Otherwise, we may not be there. Um, even this temperature rise of a one degree centigrade will will destroy 38% of India's agriculture. So, so we, we are, we are blithely unaware of the dangers of, uh, of uh, global uh, warming and uh, carbon emissions. Thank you, Kanan, for a really inspiring um, and encouraging talk. And I say encouraging in a way that may make you um, wonder, because much of your story was not happy. But the encouragement is, I feel more inspired to do more. And so I think sometimes by talking about what's happening and what has been the struggle so far, I'm hoping that you will um, create some future canons in this class, in this room today. It's my pleasure to say a couple of closing remarks before we go downstairs for the party. I want to give an incredible and very special thanks to the Alexander Campbell King Law Library of the University of Georgia School of Law. Carol Watson, the leader of that unit, could not be here today, but many of her staff are here. Could they please stand? Maureen, Marie, TJ, you have all been an incredible help and great support throughout this entire renovation project. The work of moving the Louis B. Sohn Library on International Relations from its former home on the balcony in the main building to uh, a somewhat smaller space in the Rusk Center. Uh, the work of discovering some of the books needed a little rehab themselves. Um, of trying to figure out what to put where, pulling a few books back. I'm sorry, but the book signed by Eleanor Roosevelt is not available for people to pull out and walk home with. Um, it's been a really, really challenging task. And I am very grateful both to Carol for having the vision to let us move the library to the Rusk Center space, and to all of her staff for both supporting it, um, as well as all of our work over the years, and making it a reality. We also have here today um, the members of the Dean Rusk Center, Dean Rusk International Law Center Council. And you have programs, if you turn on the back, this is a newly formed group, and I would like any members of the faculty division, the alumni division, or the counselors who are present today to please stand. Christoph, I see you for starters, Tom. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and for use, your support. We are um, very grateful and really, really uh, lucky to have so many faculty members whose work has either uh, core international uh, content, as with Professor Cohen from who you spoke, uh, from who you heard earlier, as well as work in the transnational area, people like Larry Thompson, who work on Business Crimes, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Many, many, many of you are in the room, and I appreciate you for all that you have done for us. The alumni division includes people like Charlie Cunnicutt, the chair who stood for a while. A number of people are here, and we're really happy to celebrate our alums who have done amazing things in this area. The folks who are here, you see their name. Some of the folks who couldn't be here include uh, the Deputy General Counsel of the US Department of Defense in Washington, who is the leader of the International Law Department at DOD. Jason Carter, um, who uh, has just accepted our invitation, and it coincides with his taking over of the leadership role at the Carter Center as the chairman of the Board of Trustees. We have been working. Uh, very closely in the last year or so with folks at the Carter Center, and we look forward to strengthening those ties. Ertherin Cousin, who may be about number three on the hierarchy of the United Nations. She is the executive director of the World Food Program. 
and I could go on, but I know you're hungry and thirsty and a little bit warm. I'd like to now ask the staff and the student ambassadors of the Dean Rusk International Law Center to please stand. We have been very lucky this year to uh, welcome some staff um, and also to welcome about a dozen or so student ambassadors. Anyone who is wearing this today is a member of the staff and I welcome you to talk with them. Um, Laura Coggle is our Director of International Professional Education and um, we just today, starting on her very first day, is Kathleen Doty who is our new Associate Director for Global Practice Preparation. She comes to us from the Office of the General Counsel, Department of the Navy in Washington. And our many student ambassadors um, have helped us staff the reception desk and supported us in many ways, and I'm very grateful. I will not name all the external organizations, student organizations, that have been involved in this event and have given us sponsorship. They are listed here, and I thank you very much. I guess I have two men to thank before I conclude. One would be my husband, Peter O'Neill, who is here from the Comparative Literature Department. <laughs> and has lived through the renovation in his own way. Um, and then, of course, Dean Bo Rutledge, whom we are very, very delighted, is himself an international expert in arbitration, who has given incredible support to the center, and in fact to the law school as a whole in his first now full 10 months as dean of the law school. Thank you very much. With that, I would like you to welcome you to go downstairs where Lisa Mathis has set up one of her wonderful receptions, and we will uh, celebrate the center, have a little bit of refreshment and conviviality. The center will be opened, and you are welcome to tour the renovation at your leisure. Thank you very much.